Hello and welcome to episode two of the Physique Development Podcast. This show is a question and answer based show where we take questions we've been asked by our listeners and answer them through our industry experience as coaches and from our own professional perspectives. Today, we will be discussing three commonly asked questions slash topics. Number one, how to gauge progress led by Coach Sue. Number two, how the how and why of performing deloads led by yours truly here, Coach Austin. And number three, the ins and outs and benefits of maximizing your sleep led by Coach Alex. What you can expect from today's podcast is for each topic or question to be put on the clock for about 15 to 20 minutes. The coach leading the topic or question will start the discussion. This will then be followed up by other coaches weighing in with their thoughts and persp- their thoughts and perspectives um, from their experiences. It is our goal not only to supply you, the listener, with valuable insights on the topics or questions, but also to plant some seeds for further research and thought. So without further ado, let's get into topic number one, which is going to be gauging progress. So, Sue, how can one successfully gauge their progress? Hey guys, and thanks for that intro, Austin. So I wanted to talk about progress, um, not only because it's a common question that we get, but it's also something that people often gauge their progress by one metric. And so I think it's very important to look at all the metrics here as we're diving into that. So normally people just look at the scale to gauge progress. And it's something that a lot of my clients don't even weigh themselves because it's something that we found that the scale is doing more harm than good within us being able to understand, okay, how is progress progressing, for lack of a better word. So being able to look at biofeedback is extremely important. It's something that we do in all of our check-ins is being able to look at that full picture. And so if you have a coach or if you don't have a coach, it's still extremely important to look at this biofeedback, probably even more so if you don't have a coach. So if you're listening to this and you really want to understand, okay, how do I gauge how well I'm doing within this whole thing of fitness um, and I don't have someone to be accountable to, how do I look at that? So biofeedback, is going to be huge. Looking at sleep quality and quantity, which we'll be diving into that later in this podcast, which will be super helpful for you to understand the more in depth about how sleep is important. And one of the most important things for your goals, uh, but also looking at stress levels and your management of those levels, um, energy levels throughout the day, throughout your workout, your appetite, your hunger, your strength and endurance, digestion, bloating, mental and emotional health, also looking at your water intake, measurements, sex drive, non-scale victories, um, your ability to auto-regulate, health markers, ease within planning meals and making decisions, how clothes fit, um, and then also being able to look at a few other metrics here. So those that I listed are ones that you can kind of gauge for yourself how they're going along. So being able to look at, is my sleep in a good space? Do I have good quality of sleep? Um, How are my appetite and um, energy levels? How is my digestion? How is my strength? So being able to look at all of those are going to be very helpful markers. So with sleep, being able to make sure that your quality is increasing and that your quantity is in a good spot for you to be able to have good energy throughout the day. Looking at stress levels, stress and sleep are two Two things that go very hand in hand that people often don't take um, notice of or don't look at. They're just looking at, okay, am I lifting heavier in the gym? And these two things are going to be great, great things to be able to progress forward. So being able to gauge how you are doing within your stress levels, how you're managing your stress and how you're prioritizing your sleep, um, your energy levels are going to be a huge one as well. Again, when it comes to the scale, It's showing you one piece of the picture. It's showing you how much gravitational pull you have towards the earth. And so there's a time and place for knowing what that scale weight is, but there's also a time and place for being able to read these variables and knowing how they affect your life. So if your energy levels are increased, that's something that in a second here, I'm going to read through a list of things from a client who she was kind of talking about how she still has more she wants to accomplish within working together. But I had her go back and write down everything that she feels like she has accomplished. And this is a practice I do with a lot of clients because it's very easy to get honed in on just the scale. And this client specifically doesn't weigh herself and doesn't take measurements, um, which are two things that you might be like, well, how do I know if I'm progressing without those? But being able to read these, um, this list that she gave me here in a little bit will be extremely helpful for you guys to see that it's not just about the scale. It's not just about measurements. It's about 
the the whole shebang here. So also being able to look at appetite and hunger. Let's say maybe in the past that you've had unsatiable appetite or unsatiable hunger, being able to have that satiated is going to be a marker of progress or being able to have better hunger cues as a whole. I often have people come to me and say, I don't know how to read my hunger cues or I don't feel like I have good hunger cues. So having better reflection and better reading of your body and how it is experiencing different things. Um, Also being able to look at your strength and endurance. If going to the gym used to be something where you could barely get through a session um, and your energy throughout the day was tanking, that's also something that is going to be a marker of progress, how much you have endurance within it or how much strength you are gaining. And I'm going to talk about a few more things within training here in a little bit. Um, Your digestion. If you used to have really bad digestion and really bad bathroom trips and being able to have much better digestion, that is a huge scale of progress that you can measure. Um, Being able to look at your water intake. Um, Your measurements are another great way to gauge your progress. Your sex drive, which is something people don't often talk about, but it is something that being able to have a healthy libido is important and having that healthy balance of hormones, Um, non-scale victories. So that's a huge thing within how your ease is without with going through your day. So your quality of life is an important part of this as a whole. And so non-scale victories, as far as being able to go out to eat without anxiety, being able to track some Thing without like assurance that that is perfect with tracking that, um, being able to fit into clothes that you haven't fit into before, um, being able to lift a weight uh, you haven't lifted before, being able to do a weight for more reps. Those are all non-scale victories that you're able to take that forward, being able to go to a social event without, without freaking out about food or being able to make a, an easier decision when you go out or those decisions being easier when you go out. Um, also, the ability to auto-regulate. You're, if you are able to read yourself better and make those decisions a little bit better, that's a huge gauge of progress there. And then health markers. So if your blood pressure has improved or blood glucose levels or hormones, those are all markers of progress as well. Um, and then also being able to look within training. It's not just about increasing your weight that you can lift, but also looking at your RPE. So if you're able to lift a weight for a lower RPE, or if you're able to do a weight for a better tempo, tempo or have better control control of it or better execution, or if let's say the rest periods are shorter and you're still able to do the same weight, um, or if that exercise is later in the workout and you're still able to do the same weight. So let's say that you're doing an overhead press, um, but it's after three pressing movements and you're still able to hit a higher number, that's a huge gauge of progress. So it's something that when it comes to progress, people just look at the scale or just look at how much weight they can lift Um, and just being able to see, well, the scale hasn't moved or the scale has moved. um, And what does that look like? But what I really ask clients and ask people um, to reflect on is looking at their quality of life, looking at all of these feedback markers and being able to decide how they need to move forward and how they are moving forward. So um, talking about that client that um, I kind of had made that list, some improvements that she made is being able to spend more time with her um, her significant other and her family. She is much less food focused, way more energy, more mental clarity and no brain fog, more food freedom. Um, the ability to trust herself more. uh, She's able to reevaluate what's important in her life, recognize that she doesn't need to work out several times in in one day. She has better self-awareness. She enjoys being herself more. She has better sleep. She's been able to push herself into doing uncomfortable things and growing from those situations. She's not as reactive to things or people in her life, improved relationships with friends and family, um, improved relationships with food and exercise. She actually enjoys her training and a ton of other things that she listed here. So those are all improvements outside of the scale, outside of um, aesthetics that she was able to improve on. So being able to look at all these metrics, but also understand how those look towards reaching your goals are going to be extremely important. So kind of my top tips for gauging progress and being able to work towards your goals. One is being able to have goals for yourself. So setting setting those long-term and short-term goals, which we did talk about in the last podcast. So if you haven't listened to that, then definitely go listen. Um, But being able to know what your goals are so you can accurately assess your data that you're looking at to make sure that you're reaching those goals. Um, So the next one is to be able to keep data.
data. Um, oftentimes when people don't have coaches, they're just going about it and they're just like haphazard and then they are not able to gauge their progress because they're not really keeping data on their progress. So being able to keep data, whether that's with pictures or measurements or taking time to check in with yourself of all of those biofeedback markers I listed, it's something that I highly encourage people to take note of each week. Take that time to reflect on your week, check in with yourself of how things were going and then making the plan for the next week instead of just kind of being like, oh, I feel like I could add more cardio in right now or whatever it may be. Um, It's also going to be as far as being able to video your exercises to see how form is improving um, and being able to keep track of that. And then the two last things I would say for tips are keeping a training journal and keeping a feel good journal. So we do have a video on the physique development YouTube talking about a training journal and all the benefits of that, but being able to go through and see your true progression in that training journal, instead of just like, oh, I feel like I lifted heavier today or I feel weak today, you're actually able to see that data and see how that all um, evens out. And then as far as the feel good journal, that's something else as far as being able to take inventory of how you're feeling, kind of using descriptive words like energized, satiated, grumpy, deprived, stuffed, bloated, so that you're able to look back and reflect on how you're feeling um, and being able to know at the end of each day, did you feel good in your body? Were there things that you did that day that made you feel good in your body? Um, And being able to look at that and again, have that data look back and reflect is going to be extremely helpful for being able to gauge progress um, and look at that as a whole. So those are my top tips for knowing how to gauge progress and different things you can do to gauge progress um, and being able to reach your overall goals. Extremely valuable. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. And a lot to take away there. Um, So if you guys need to kind of rewind and take some notes there, um, absolutely do it because there's so much there to take. Uh, and there's so much there that we use with clients uh, that whether you have a coach or not can be used on your own. Or if you're a coach yourself and you're not using those <clears throat> metrics uh, within your client's biofeedback tracking, then that is a good idea uh, to to start using some of those as progress markers outside of the aesthetics, right? And so uh, to expand on what Sue said, I just... I basically just want to uh, kind of highlight a few things she said rather than adding anything just because I think she did a phenomenal job. Uh, so the the overarching thing here, and I know most of you would have probably heard this by now, but what gets measured gets managed. Um, and basically that lies or falls into something I say a lot, which is success lies in the metrics we are tracking, right? So it's very contextual um, to what we're trying to improve upon. Um, So if you come in uh, and you set goals from the beginning, one, it's important to set, you know, maybe it it is important to set some physical goals um, with a physical endeavor such as this one. Um, But it's, I think, even more important to set goals that are uh, beyond the physical, uh, whether those are those are mental or or mental health uh, from a mental health perspective or anything of the sort. I think it's incredibly important to, to make non-physical goals, to make mental and emotional goals um, that will bleed positively uh, into the rest of your life. So again, remembering what those goals are and returning back to them often, um, but understanding they may not change week to week, but when you look back month to month, they absolutely you know should be progressing. Or if they're not, we need to take a look at some things that we're implementing or we're using to to then change and adjust or pivot into a new direction that better facilitates those. Uh, and then just highlighting consistent strength training and quality nutrition extends beyond the scale and measurements. So impacting training success, whether that's strength, endurance, muscle growth, uh, mindset, uh, stress management, cognition, energy. These are things that you may not hear a ton about. Um, or even consider, but there's so much to strength training and feeding your body quality nutrition that does extend beyond the scale. It extends beyond the measurements and it extends beyond the sort of physical aesthetic goals that you may have. So that's all I wanted to add. Um, I'll give it to Alex now to see what I may have missed there. (laughs) I'm just going to have two quick points. Um, 
because both of them touched on this greatly. So with the first one, it's just very liberating to, to understand that there's so much more that you can track or see progression in uh, from clients or just from yourself within your own fitness journey uh, to have all these different components and say, okay, well, really, you know, you may be very upset that you haven't lost all the weight that you maybe have wanted. And then you're able to look at all the things that Sue and Austin touched on. And you're like, damn, I've, I've, I've kicked ass over the past, you know, three months or whatever it's been. And so that's very cool for uh, you as the listener to, to realize. And then one thing that we have uh, physique development clients do when they do depart is that, you know, I, we encourage to still use the check-in doc, to still use the tracker sheet to allow for years to kind of self audit each week of like, okay, how am I progressing? You know, all the things that Sue's already touched on where uh, you're still going to have those checkpoints, even with, even though you're not sending it to a coach, you're still able to look at the photos, still able to compare the photos and look at all the biofeedback uh, to see that progress. And that's going to be helpful for you to still sustain the goals that you had with your coach, because it's a very cool feeling to spend six months to a year to two years working with a coach and having great results. But it's even cooler to be able to come back to that coach a year later and say, hey, look what I've been able to uh, accomplish even more so uh, after our time uh, concluded working together. So very awesome uh, points there. Now we will move into into question two. Austin, should we be performing deloads within our training? And if so, how should we implement them uh, throughout the training itself? Well, great question, Alex. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this was a this was a common <laughs> question um, among our listenership here. Uh, and our people who kind of follow us through social and, and that stuff. And it's just a common question in general. And deloads, uh, period, training periodization as a whole is sort of a, I want to say a gray area, but it's it's something that you can get lost in very easily, but understand that it's just a way of organizing and conceptualizing the big picture of training and trying to attest to all the the stressors and, and the needs by your body and your physiology to sort of maximize things over time, right? So um, if we're thinking really short term, deloads may seem like something that don't really matter um, or may just get in the way of you progressing, uh, which I will get to and make sense of for you. But if you're looking at big picture things, then it's really important to to consider these times of deloads, right? And I always, I, I, I commonly talk about um, kind of life periodization as well, right? Even in life, we need these down periods. Think of them as like holidays or weeks off uh, or, um, or vacations, whatever you like to call them. These are life deloads within life's periodization of, of working hard and then needing a break and then working hard and needing a break. But without those breaks, it's hard to continue to work harder and harder and harder over time, right? So fatigue of life accumulates and fatigue of training accumulates, right? So just to introduce deloads here, uh, deloads are a key component of proper training programming, right? So a deload is often referred to as a light week or even a back off week from training, okay? That's the most common definition where volume and intensity are decreased to lower fatigue that has accumulated over that phase to enhance recovery and to get you ready to kick some ass in your next training cycle or training phase. Uh, a deload needs to help facilitate the recovery needed for you to return back to a state where you can do hard training again, right? So if you're someone who really enjoys to train hard, which I know us in this room right now um, or on this podcast really do like to train hard, and I'm going to assume that a lot of you listening like to train hard and challenge yourself and to to quote sue here do hard things which is very important to do over time um, and can bring a host of benefits um, outside again of the physical so if we want to continue to train hard we need a deload um, and a deload that helps facilitate the recovery needed for us to return back to a state where we can do that hard training again okay so the more damage that has been done from either overreaching or overstaying our welcome in a certain type of training, the longer the deload will need to be. Okay, so keep that in mind um, as we go here. So a common length for a deload is typically a week, um, could be two weeks, but I have absolutely programmed them in and seen them to be all the way up to four weeks, 
right? And those are going to kind of vary. I'd say the most common one is going to be at the one week deload. Um, but that's if you're using them strategically, intelligently, and more often than not. Okay. And we'll kind of get into how often to, to potentially add them in and kind of what a planned or reactive deload is a little bit later. Okay. So to get to the main question here, should we perform deloads? Yes, I believe you should. Okay. And here's why. First, we need to take a look at what happens when we strength train. All right. So I'm going to use a couple terms here. I'm going to introduce a couple terms if you're not familiar with them that are pretty common within the sports science community um, and just help us make sense of what's kind of going on in our within our physiology while we strength train or really cause any stress uh, to our system. Okay. So the first one uh, is going to be the general adaptation syndrome. I'll say that again because I, I messed that one up. General adaptation syndrome, which is like typically the GAS model, G-A-S, um, which basically explains the stimulus we're creating in our training uh, creates a response followed by an alarm stage coupled with a resistance stage where positive adaptations occur. Okay, so we have that alarm stage, which is basically our initial response to that stimulus um, where things will sort of go down, if you will, as far as our abilities and performance. But then this is coupled with a resistance stage um, where physiology basically is fighting against that, making positive adaptations occur. This ultimately leads to bringing us back to a baseline or homeostasis or slightly above eventually um, if proper recovery is um, followed there to positive training adaptations. Okay, so I'll break that down a little further here. That leads us into the what is known as the fitness fatigue model, okay, which shows us the relationship between improving fitness and the fatigue that will accumulate throughout a training phase, right? So with, throughout any training phase we do, our goal is to obviously improve our fitness, which falls under performance, falls under um, sort of any umbrella of fitness altogether, right? So positive adaptations, you can think of it that way. But fatigue will build um, throughout that phase, right? So although fitness is improving incrementally, fatigue is also accumulating incrementally, which can, if we don't dissipate that fatigue, which means get rid of it, um, which typically that's what we use deloads for. Actually, most often that's what we're using deloads for is to help dissipate or get rid of that fatigue that has accumulated over that given training block, which could be, or phase, which could be, you know, if the phase, let's say is four weeks or six weeks or, or whatever that is, right? So um, I would say commonly within our, um, within a lot of our athletes, but a lot of our more, especially more advanced clients or people that just really love to train hard, you know, that that's going to come after four or five, six weeks of training. Um, and again, that's uh, fatigue is going to build at different rates within an individual. Um, so this goes down to that individual's uh, sort of fatigue tolerance, their volume tolerance, their recoverability. So their ability to recover from doing hard or stressful things. Um, and depending on the health status or genetics or a lot of different things, um, this can vary per individual. But um, it's generally with the people we work with, at least, um, and, and the folks that you may work with, it's going to sort of be within a certain range, right? It's not going to be like, well, this person needs one after a week or this person, be it that you programmed correctly, or this person needs one after like eight months of training, right? So it's not going to be that drastic. Um, and if it is, then you may need to go back to the drawing board of programming and, and maybe fill in some, some holes there, uh, within your, uh, the way you're programming. But again, fatigue is going to build at different rates, depending on the individual, how they're training, how well they're recovering from everything. Uh, this is why sleep and nutrition and stress management are so important. And, uh, Alex is definitely going to touch on, uh, the sleep component of that. Um, and it also goes back to gauging progress as well. And, uh, taking a look at biofeedback, which, uh, Sue just touched on very well there as well. So, um, where do deloads come in? Deloads make their way into our training in two different ways, right? So I kind of alluded to these earlier. One is planned, a planned deload, and one is a reactive deload. Um, 
or you can kind of think it as the plan as sort of like a proactive deload and the other one is still going to stay reactive um, in a deload sense. So a plan deload is the one or a proactive deload is the one that is a little bit more proactive and is actually preset within your programming by your coach or whoever's writing your programming. So that may be yourself um, or maybe a program that you bought um, from someone uh, or the coach, uh, your coach's program they've written for you. Okay, so that's more going to be the preset. Um, hey, at five weeks, we're going to take a deload just because the way we progress and accumulated volume here or intensity, it's going to be a good idea to go ahead and sort of pre-plan that. Um, and those have their place, absolutely. And the reactive deload is a little bit more advanced and takes into consideration the individual, how they're recovering and progressing uh, throughout their current training. So this gets into kind of if you have a coach or you are a coach yourself or you're someone who is keeping track of biofeedback um, like these other two have mentioned throughout uh, this episode so far, um, you can sort of reactively implement a deload uh, based off of more of the feedback perspective, uh, based off strength numbers, based off recoverability, um, sleep, stress, uh, all of these factors, right? Uh, digestion is one as well that it's going to sort of flare up. Um, you were looking for drastic changes, right, from week to week, um, meaning so if the first five weeks of this phase, everything's progressing well, and at week six or at maybe at week five, something changes, sleep sleep tanks, digestion tanks, um, I'm not improving, my strength is actually de or, uh, digressed or decreased. These are things, these are telling signs of the start to, to moving in the opposite direction that we're wanting to move in. And that's a great time to deload, right? Um, and as you get more advanced, as you get better at sort of being able to read yourself or read your clients uh, or read, their cl read your clients' biofeedback, you're gonna be able to be a little bit more proactive with it. Um, it can still be reactive in nature, but you're gonna be a little bit more proactive on the reactive side, um, basically meaning uh, as you're moving through the weeks, let's say you didn't pre-plan a deload, but at week four or five, you're noticing a trend. And then in week, you know, nine or 10 or 11, you're noticing that trend happen again. And you kind of know this is the, the telltale sign of, of that sort of pre-exposure to uh, regression or digression within our goal, right? So we kind of take that deload a little bit earlier. Um, that way we don't wait until things go wrong before we implement the deload um, a little bit more proactively, right? So neither one is technically right, uh, but both can have their advantages. So from experience, uh, those who are newer to training can typically stay in a phase or training block a little longer uh, than someone who is a little bit more advanced. Um, this goes for a lot of different reasons. Um, so a reactive deload for this client may be helpful. Um, so you don't pull them out of something that is working and will continue to work for weeks to come, right? And this is something that I know uh, all of us have experienced where you get a client in who may be a little newer um, or maybe they're coming off a long layoff and you programmed really well for them from the beginning. And let's say you're six, seven, eight weeks in and they're just still crushing it under the same sort of training. Do we take them out or should we have taken them out at four weeks? It's hard to say, right? And that's sort of where that reactive um, deload comes in. And that's where your, your decision-making as an individual or as a coach comes in and trying to understand where all that feedback is, right? How is that client feeling? Uh, how are they perceiving their stress? Are they, are they telling you everything um, that's going on in their life? Are they sharing that within their check-ins? Um, to be sure that it's not just the physical things that are look kind of checking out or looking really good, but also the mental side of things are also checking out, looking really good um, from a hunger perspective, uh, making sure that we're not tanking any of the things that we don't want um, to tank, right? Which the only thing we really want to tank, I would say, would be uh, or move backwards. It'd probably maybe be some weight uh, and body fat levels. But other than that, we don't want any el anything else to like tank. We probably don't want those to tank either, right? We want those to trend in a, in a fairly consistent pattern. Um, couple last things here, um, the training intensity. Okay. So I'm getting, going to get into how 
we're going to start to use these deloads within our training, right? So we've decided we need one. And now how are we going to implement this and get into uh, the weeds here a bit on now how do we transition into one and start using it within our training? Okay. So the training intensity during a deload uh, should be high enough to maintain strength and neuromuscular adaptations, right? So we don't want to go from uh, training with, you know, moderately heavy loads to uh, let's say training at a hundred pounds on a lift to then using 10 pounds, right? So that's not what we're wanting to do. Um, we need to be intense enough where we're going to maintain some strength. We're going to maintain our neuromuscular adaptations. Um, but however, not so high to cause fatigue and further connective tissue damage, right? Um, so those reps in reserve or those RPE numbers um, will need to be, if you're using reps in reserve, um, those will need to be increased or if you're using RPE, those will need to, need to be decreased, right? Um, so reducing the proximity to failure, right? So we're reducing the, the closeness we are to achieving failure within a given set, which is gonna help over that week sort of dissipate that fatigue and allow ourselves to sort of deal with that, handle that, um, and get ourselves back up to a baseline where we're gonna reap the benefits of those adaptations keep that fitness that we've accumulated, but we're gonna get rid of that fatigue um, or a good chunk of that fatigue that we had accumulated over the weeks, right? So that's positive. And you can see as that starts to trend over and over and over, over a long duration of time, that's going to index well for positive adaptations, positive results, uh, sort of trending forward. Um, so the overall volume, um, so we talked about intensity a bit or proximity to failure as well. The overall volume should be decreased to a maintenance volume, most typically. If you don't sufficiently decrease the volume, you won't get rid of accumulated fatigue, right? And this can defeat the purpose of the deload. So if you're going to choose to do a deload, and there are a couple types of deloads I'm going to get to here, um, but one we, we use a lot, um, or a couple we use quite a, quite a bit, um, and there, there's two different ones. But if you don't sufficiently decrease the volume or change the stimulus in which we'll get to you you're not going to rid that accumulated fatigue um, and this again is going to defeat the purpose of you doing a deload or performing a deload which in essence is just suboptimal week of training um, where you didn't really achieve much of anything so that can be frustrating if you don't fully lean into the to the goal of that week okay so if you're unsure on what your maintenance volume would be um, it's suggested that your current you would cut your current volume by 30 to 60 percent um, and this can be in the form of sets or reps uh, per session or training week, right? If you're dieting, little caveat here, if you're dieting, it may be advantageous to eat at maintenance uh, since an energy deficit may interfere with your ability to recover. And this, again, can defeat the, the overarching uh, purpose of a deload. Now, special case here, if you're in prep um, and you're on a strict timeline, you may not have the option. Uh, you may just have to take what you can get from a reduction in volume and intensity or change in stimulus. Uh, but if you do have the time and you do have the sort of the, the, the resources to allocate to that, I would recommend, uh, or we would, we would recommend to do that. Um, so for beginners, uh, finishing up here for beginners, it's advised that you reduce training loads by about 10 to 20% uh, for the week of the deload or for the duration of that deload. Um, again, beginners can get away with not reducing as much. Um, just because again, they haven't accumulated probably as much fatigue, but also they're not creating as much tension or, or as much, uh, having as much neurological efficiency or effectiveness within a given session. So you can, you can decrease a little bit, um, or to a lesser amount. So that 10 to 20% for the week, advanced athletes or advanced trainees, um, it's advised that you reduce your set volume by around 50% if you can, um, of where it would, would have peaked in the previous weeks of training and reduce those uh, reps and reserve numbers by a couple points um, or decrease those RPE numbers by a couple points. For example, if you ended your last training week at one to two reps in reserve or a eight or nine RPE, um, you would reduce those uh, to a three to four reps in reserve during your deload, for example, um, or your RPE would go to uh, seven or eight or, or six to eight or whatever. Um, just to, again, bring down that proximity to failure and allow for that recovery to happen. Okay, so there's also another one um, that I'll touch briefly on, but this is a time where you can kind of dive into a different training training stimulus altogether. 
And a lot of the adaptations or the fitness to, to kind of take hold from the last phase. And we can still train hard within a different training system or stress, right? So for example, a common one we may use, like if you were in a higher rep, higher volume, hypertrophy driven phase, maybe we can switch into a higher intensity, lower volume, neurological or strength-based phase strength based phase or block, right? Which is going to, to, to use different systems. Um, it's going to be a different stimulus altogether. And we're still going to be able to, this is being, you're not completely beat down going into this. Um, if, if we just see that we're starting to, to plateau a bit, but we're still have a lot of energy and recoverability available, we can use this sort of transition deload, um, instead of using like a quote unquote full deload, which involves again, dropping that total volume. Um, and intensities across the week. All right, just a quick recap. Um, deloads are a valuable part of long term of the long term equation of intelligent programming and fitness. And a deload needs to help facilitate the recovery needed for you to return back to a state where you can do hard training again. Right? We need to be able to do hard things continuously over time. But that does take these weeks where we are taking things back a step. Right? So the more damage that's been done from either overreaching or overstaying your welcome in a certain type of training, the longer that deload will need to be. Okay. So let's keep our eyes on our biofeedback and progress and utilize deloads uh, to maximize results in the gym for ourselves or for our clients. And that's all she wrote for me. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I got. <laughs> um, so with, with deloads, I don't have a ton to, to add as Austin did a fantastic job and, and touched on many of the points that I would have as well. Uh, within our prep clients and, and Austin spoke on not being able to potentially go up to, to maintenance levels from a caloric perspective. Uh, things that we implement as a staff in that situation is that we're going to uh, double up on anti-inflammatories. So we're going to uh, probably double the dose of the omega threes that you're taking. Uh, if you're using things, um, uh, like uh, turmeric or curcumin or anything like that, we may double up on that. Um, and then we're going to make a huge point of, of antioxidants and getting plenty of vitamins and minerals from our food. So your fruit and vegetable intake is going to skyrocket in that time frame too. Uh, so making even, it's always a great priority within your dieting phase as a whole, but in that deloading phase, if we're not able to bring you up calorically, then at that point, we're just going to really push from a, a fruit and vegetable perspective as well. Um, and I think that was really the, the main point. I think that an easy analogy here within deloads is just thinking that you're, you yourself are a vehicle and you are using that gas pedal, however you are within your training and you're going to run out of gas at some point. And so being able to pay attention to the biofeedback, pull over, get you some gas and, and get back rolling, serving as your deload is going to be the best way to think about it. I'm very surprised Alex didn't make a joke about me running out of gas on the side of the road um, during <laughs> that because that has happened to me and I had to wait in my car for an hour for a tow truck. That's to that come. four week deload. Uh, too. That, yeah. yeah, it was. It was um, super, super great learning experience. Um, there's not a lot of gas stations from Cordon to Evansville. Um, and if you pass Cordon, Zero. you're just kind of stuck. So. <laughs> Pro tip, if you're a Midwestern Westerner, um, but uh, the things I wanted to touch on, I mean, Austin did a great job diving into it and Alex covering some nutrition side of that. Um, but a common phrase or a phrase that I had heard from um, one of our friends, Alan Kress, is deload to reload. So it is going to be a great time. Don't think of it as like a step back and you are regressing, but more so as like you are taking that step to be able to continue progressing. And um, Austin touched on this of being able to have those breaks in life. And that's how I phrase it to clients and to other people is just the fact that you need breaks from everything in life. It's a reason that we take breaks to sleep. We can't be awake all the time. We take breaks from tracking because we need that mental rest or even having free meals of taking that time away from tracking. 
Um, we take breaks from work and going on vacation. Um, we have the weekends. They're all built in because as humans, we are not machines. Sometimes we like to think we are where we can just go, go, go. Um, but we do need to take breaks and to be able to be progressive. So um, within deloads, they're phenomenal, as hopefully you have gotten through your head at this point. Um, but they're essential for speeding up your ability to make progress and to avoid plateaus. Oftentimes I hear people say like, oh, I've hit a plateau. Um, but it might be because they've been pushing too much too long and need to take that break, need to fill up the tank. Um, so it's also something as far as being able to decrease inflammation, which we kind of touched, touched on, um, but also improve detoxification and removal of cellular waste. So certain types of training demand a large supply of your body's resources to run recovery processes. And so your body will naturally prioritize those as it wants those for survival. Um, and so this can result in other processes either taking place less frequently than is optimal or at a slower rate. Um, so that can be detrimental to your health, both on a cellular and systemic level. So backing off training of that stimulus um, can be very helpful to make sure that your body is running as programmed. So everything else has basically been touched on, except the last thing will just be mental health, because we do, again, need breaks from that. There's clients that I have. One is a night shift worker. Um, and she also switch, sli- switches shifts. So she'll switch between day and night shift. Um, and during that time frame, she had this long slew of work because she had a lot on her plate um, and she was kind of overworked. And so we took the whole week off of training and it went by. She was super scared to do it to begin with. It went by super quick. And then she had uh, vocalized to me. I didn't even realize how much I needed that. Now I'm excited to get back in the gym. And that's another thing. Being able to look at what your enjoyment is towards the gym. If the gym starts to become a drag, which every once in a while it will, that is a okay. We are not always going to be just so amped to get to the gym. Sometimes it is just discipline, Um, but it is something if it comes like an something where it's no longer enjoyable, you might need that time away to reignite your excitement for the gym. Um, We all are passionate about training, but we want to um, do more to life. We shouldn't just live to train, but train to enhance our enjoyment of life and our ability to have a better quality of life. Um, So being able to look at that. So taking some days off here and there without throughout your week um, to enjoy time with family, as well as taking time off as a whole can decrease um, that mental stress and have that effect on your body that's going to be extremely beneficial for you down the road um, and being able to continue to have that progress. So um, as Austin had mentioned within the deload, the time frame can vary. And then also the way you go about it as far as either switching stimulus or doing a uh, percentage is less, but it can also be something where you either take all of it off of training and implement a different type of training. So sometimes I'll have clients not go to the gym at all, but still have some sort of movement goal. So uh, often Oftentimes it's yoga because that is extremely helpful for that rest and digest. And it also gives them another form of movement instead of just, I need to get in the gym, pounding the weights and getting after it. Because when it comes to physical activity, it's there's so many things that you can do for physical activity. So also getting clients out of the mindset that going to the gym is the only way they can see progress. So encouraging them to have a step goal during that time, encouraging them to take the time that they would have spent in the gym and spend that with their family or taking that time to spend on themselves or to meal prep or to go on walks or do yoga. So it is very multifaceted and extremely beneficial throughout your fitness journey. So that's everything on deloads. And then we're going to move over to Alex here and learn a little bit about sleep. So when it comes to sleep, what are the ins and outs and benefits of maximizing sleep, Alex? I'm so glad you asked this as I have all the answers. All of them. All right. So uh, this is interesting because all three of us select a question uh, from clients or from uh, people who follow or follow Instagram, follow us on Instagram. And uh, it's interesting because all three of these tied together, which is which is awesome. Uh, This is going to sleep itself is going to be the one of the if not the biggest contributor to your muscle gain or or fat loss goals that you have, Uh, especially now and in the culture that we live in where it's go, 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 go. Uh, you know, sleep when you're dead type thought process. Uh, sleep is going to be your biggest 
enhancement uh, that can be to your life as a whole, as well as all of your fitness goals. Now, if we run into a situation where we are having low sleep, even in the short term, we're going to experience some negative uh, side effects from that. And in the short term, we're going to experience uh, raised cortisol levels, uh, irritability. With those raised cortisol levels, we're going to uh, see that hinder uh, fat loss. Um, and then we're also going to see a reduction in insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance, which is, of course, going to hinder our fat loss goals. And then we will also see in the short term, leptin and ghrelin being uh, affected in the sense that uh, our hunger signaling is going to be negatively affected, could be in a, a surplus of you know insatiable hunger. And it also could be in the opposite direction where the individual is is not hungry at all. We, you know, it, what we see from a research perspective is that seems to be more genetically traced than anything else, but you could go on opposite ends of the extremes on that front. And then growth hormone and testosterone are going to be affected from a hormonal function perspective as while we are sleeping, especially in quality sleep, those two things, growth hormone and testosterone production, are going to be very much so enhanced. If we see a long-term low sleep, uh, we're going to see the aging process be accelerated. We're going to see a disruption in circadian rhythm, which is going to uh, affect many things, mood, anxiety, um, cognitive function, your energy levels on the long haul. Uh, and then it could also worsen any chronic or uh, degenerative diseases that you may be experiencing. So as I use the scare tactic of, of having <laughs> low sleep here, let's dig into how we maximize the, uh, your sleep as a whole. And I want to start with the environment and routine of your sleep, as this is going to be the, the most foo-foo uh, of them all, uh, according to many, but this is going to play a, a huge factor. So having a, a, set time of sleep and a set time of waking all seven days of the week is going to be immensely beneficial in terms of routine and setting up the structure of, of your circadian rhythm as a whole. Um, and then within your environment, uh, and routine itself, establishing this within kind of like your initial one to two hours before you go to sleep and the initial one to two hours of, of when you're waking is going to be very beneficial uh, to the production of your day, as well as getting yourself into the rhythmic um, timing uh, of your sleep as a whole. And so when we're looking at the kind of the nighttime routine, we want to look at limiting the, the screen activity, uh, blue light exposure that you're having, whether that be movies, whether that be your phone, your laptop, trying to cut that out about two to three hours before you go to bed. Now, I understand that's not necessarily feasible for maybe you as an individual who has 16 credit hours right now, as well as working, you know, 20 to 30 hours at your part-time job, you're trying to get homework done right before you have to go to bed. And so utilizing things such as blue light, uh, glasses blockers will be beneficial for you in that sense, because I know it's not always just feasible to like turn all the lights off and use candles and, and sing Kumbaya with your significant <laughs> other. Um, so that's going to be a good thing there. Outdoor leisurely walks, yoga, uh, reading a good book, relaxing with your spouse. Those type of things are going to put you in a parasympathetic state, which is going to get you in a, a restful mindset to be ready to go to sleep and, and getting everything from a hormonal secretion perspective in the right place. Um, a hot shower before bed, a very clean environment within your within your bedroom, uh, clean sheets, and then also like scents. I, I'm I'm someone who responds very uh, very well to the smell of different things, and so I I categorize different places with or different task, I should say, with the the scent. And so that could be helpful, like a lavender essential oil or something like that could be something that you associate with uh, sleeping in and of itself. Um, so that's the, the environment and the routine aspect of things. Now, as we look at maybe the nutritional aspect of maximizing your sleep, uh, a larger meal, maybe two to three hours before bed is going to be beneficial. Uh, if you're going to have something smaller, maybe 60 minutes, trying not to eat you know, 20 minutes, before, uh, this massive meal, 20 minutes before bed, trying to digest that food while you're trying to sleep is probably not going to be the most comfortable or relaxing. Um, and then having that meal being more of a, a balanced macro intake. I'm sure that some of you have maybe read that a high 
carb meal before bed is going to en enhance the quality of your sleep. And we do want to have carbs in that meal, of course, but having this large bolus is not necessary. And then maybe some of you have also read that having carbs before bed is going to blunt the secretion of human growth hormone. And so now we look at this and say, we just want to have balance. We want to have protein. We want to have carbohydrates. We want to have fats within that meal to, um, assist our body in, in the recovery process. Um, cutting off caffeine consumption at 10 hours before bed, man, is that an ask. <laughs> but it will be beneficial to you in terms of your overall quality of sleep and not trying to metabolize that caffeine while you're trying to rest. So as close as you can get to that 10 hour marker is going to be the best and then not trying or trying not to consume too many fluids close to bed. So if you're, you know, if you're falling behind on your water, let's say you've got like 60 ounces and you're going to bed in about an hour. Uh, I would tell you just to sip the water, chalk it up as an L for the day and uh, do a better job of, of getting your fluids in the day before or the next day. Uh, now, when we look at, at training, uh, training close to the time that you're wanting to go to bed is going to have your central nervous system revved up and probably going to inhibit your ability to get into that restful state. So doing your best to uh, train at the latest, maybe four hours prior to uh, to going to bed is a, kind of a, a good rule of thumb, if you will. But finding yourself where you're, you're training and then trying to get into this restful state and quality of sleep, right? We're not looking for just closing our eyes and being able to lay in the bed for X amount of time. More so, we're looking for how can we get the most quality and go through all the different phases within our sleep and maximize our recovery and all the different things that we are wanting to transpire in that time frame. Um, and then this leads me into the, the supplementation portion of things. Uh, supplementation is uh, something that we do not want to use as a crutch. We do not want to use as a substitute, if you will, for quality nutrition uh, and, and all the other pieces that we spoke on, but it can be helpful. And so I'm going to go over five of my favorite supplements that will be pertaining to before bed. Uh, the first being magnesium glycinate. Why magnesium glycinate than any other magnesium that there would be because there's many different forms. Uh, so when we look at magnesium glycinate, this is going to be the highest absorption form of the magnesium from a research perspective. So this magnesium is going to help with, um, muscle relaxation, it's going to help with body temperature control. And then we have seen uh, it be helpful in GABA production, which is going to help in terms of mental relaxation as well. So that's going to be the number one in terms of uh, dosage within that. It can range, I would say, between 200 and 400 milligrams is going to be your friend on that front. Um, Omega-3s, this is going to be an anti-inflammatory that we would be utilizing throughout the day as a whole anyway. Uh, but this is going to be helpful. Uh, DHA, so you, if, if you're a client of physique development, uh, you hear us speak very frequently on the high amount of EPA and DHA content within the fish oil. Uh, and with the DHA it is going to help with the secretion of melatonin, which of course we want at that time. And then it's going to help with the decrease in inflammation as well as improving the uh, body temperature. Glycine is going to be fantastic as well. This is going to help with uh, relaxing the mind, lowering the body temperature. Theanine is going to be helpful as well, where that's going to help, again, with relaxation, getting you into that state of being ready to go to sleep. And then the final is going to be rudicarpin, which is an herb, and this is going to help with the metabolization of caffeine. I, I spoke on cutting out the caffeine about 10 hours before bed earlier. I know that many of you listening are, are laughing and saying, I don't know if I can do that. And so rudicarpin is going to be helpful with you metabolizing that caffeine and, and resensitizing, if you will. I'm using air quotes for those who cannot see us, <laughs> um, your adrenals to the caffeine and, and allowing for that caffeine to have the same effect the days you know to come. Uh, because as many of you have found that your, your single uh, 3D energy or your single rain every day is now turning into maybe uh, two. And so we want to cut that back down to hopefully one um, and, and keep you in the best spot possible. So that was a ton of information in terms of improving your sleep and maximizing it as a whole. Um, let's have these two guys weigh in. 
Yeah, you absolutely killed it there and went over a whole slew of things. So definitely, if you need to go back and re-listen to some of that, then go ahead and do that. So I'm going to kind of go over some things within sleep, how Alex talked about within this day and age, people kind of are like, oh, I don't need sleep. Um, and something, I, a phrase I would like to say is sleep isn't for the weak, it's for the elite. So sleep is a missing element element of so many people's fitness routines um, and when it comes to sleep and everything it does for you. So Alex kind of talked on it um, at the beginning, but it can disrupt how or lack of sleep or chronic lack of sleep can disrupt how your body sends information, make it more difficult to concentrate or learn new things. It can decrease coordination and balance. It can negatively affect your mental abilities and emotional state. It can compromise decision-making processes and creativity. It can weaken your immune system, which none of us have time for right now. Um, it can also worsen existing respiratory diseases. It can affect your bowel movements, but it can also lead to fat gain, as Alex talked about, with increased levels of ghrelin and de decreased levels of leptin. It can also make you too tired to train or make your tra training sessions lower quality or put you at more risk for injury. It can reduce your fat cells ability to respond properly to insulin, which can not only promote fat storage, but can also increase risk for type two diabetes. And it can affect your blood sugar, blood pressure, inflammation levels, and it is linked to increased risk of heart attack. Um, and it can affect more home hormones than those already mentioned. And if it wasn't made clear, um, sleep can help you gain muscle and lose fat and sleep is free. So how cool is that, but a free re way for you to help gain muscle and lose fat, which I know we're all trying to do, um, or most of us are. And um, sleep, extra sleep tends to bring a bunch of benefits rather than the unfavorable si side effects. So being able to prioritize your sleep is going to be a massive, massive thing that you want to do. So not taking the mindset that sleep is for the weak, um, but really being able to recognize that sleep is for the elite. And it's extremely, 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 extremely beneficial. Um, and it is not something that you you should just be like, oh, I've got everything else taken care of. I can kind of have less sleep here. And something else I'd like to mention within sleep is that oftentimes people are like, oh, I caught up on sleep. Um, there's no sleep bank. You can't really catch up on it. If you have decreased sleep one night and then you sleep more the next night, it doesn't really even out. You're still feeling the effects. Now, it's not that you shouldn't try to get more sleep, but it's not that you can actually catch up on sleep. So taking, making sure it's a priority because you can't get that back of the effects that it's done on your body. Um, Alex talked about some different nutrients um, or different uh, supplements to utilize. And one that he didn't mention that I know a lot of people do use is melatonin. And one thing I want to note within melatonin, it is not a long-term solution. So melatonin can be helpful short-term to help buffer cortisol and increase serotonin, but I would not use it as a Band-Aid and just constantly take melatonin. Um, he also mentioned GABA as far as um, magnesium helping with that, but you can also take GABA to help calm the mind and signal the body. And then taurine is another one um, that we like to pair often with theanine, especially if clients are training later in the day to increase GABA and help relax the nervous system. And then vitamin B6 and B9 can help restore neurotransmitters, their receptors, um, and make sure that you're in a good spot there. Um, another thing within the um, supplements and looking at that for if you are training later in the day, possibly using a non-stem pre-workout so you can still get the benefits of the pre-workout without having the caffeine in place. Is that something that normally if we're working out later in the day, we do reach for that non-stem just because we know it's very easy to become overly caffeinated um, and just overdo it. It's very, very easy to overdo it. Um, and then being able to make sure your training is in line, like Alex talked about, but also making sure that your nutrients post-workout are in a good spot um, and within the last two meals before you go to sleep. Um, and then being able to look at your sleep. If you're having problems with waking up within the two hours of going to sleep or waking up um, between like 1 and 3 a.m. or 3 and 5 a.m. or 5 and 7 a.m., those are all going to be things that need to be addressed specifically. So don't take it as like normal to wake up multiple times throughout the night, tossing and turning or having night sweats. Those are all deeper issues that really need to be combated there. Um, so if it is those, then I would encourage you to reach out to someone just because those are ones that you want addressed and you want to take care of and you don't want to be in a place where um, 
you've now had chronic lack of sleep and all the things that Alex had mentioned that were very scary can happen. If you do have chronic lack of sleep, you don't want those to come back and bite you in the behind. So those are the main things that I have in regards to sleep. So Austin, take yeah. it away. Behind. The behind, man. Yeah. Behind. <laughs> it's, don't let it bite you That's in right. the behind. Um, yeah, and I'm going to speak know. about uh, <laughs> one thing that you, you would not want to bite you in the behind either, which is um, I, I like this lion analogy. Um, and I know I've mentioned this before. I heard this on a podcast. It was like a Ted talk or something. Um, and this just resonated so, so well with me. Um, and so <clears throat> we, we often associate not sleeping kind of with this domination sort of mentality of, of grind and getting shit done and, um, sleep is for the week, Right. And uh, I like Sue saying a sleep is for the elite. Um, and if we think of an elite, I would say lions are one of the most elite things on this planet. Um, and they sleep 15 to 20 hours per day, depending on their responsibilities, goals. Um, but the obviously we're different animals altogether, right? Which is important, uh, which is an important distinction, right? So I'm not trying to compare us to, to lions and I'm not trying to tell you to... Uh, sleep 15 to 20 hours a day because if that's the case then you have other problems but what i am saying is we would never call a lion weak for sleeping 15 to 20 hours a day right everything's in context and it's very important to understand that increasing the effectiveness of the hours you have in a day and utilizing the most all the benefits of sleep so it's saying we need seven to nine hours per night, which is going to vary per individual. But our seven to nine is that lion's 15 to 20, right? So everything's contextual. And I think instead of trying to, and I think we've all been here, instead of trying to wake yourself up at 4.30 and get your day going, because that's what Jocko said, and then going to bed at midnight, uh, because that's what Gary V said, um, and then doing that repeatedly over and over, but you find out very quickly that with those two very contrasting, um, wake up and sleep times, you're not having a day like Jocko or Gary V, right? You're, you're just kind of like floating along and you're going to have eb ebbs and flows throughout your day, um, that are filled with a lot of blank space, uh, typically and, and lack of productivity. And this is coming from experience. This is coming from, uh, someone who, does take the the hours I spend working or doing something um, within a day seriously. And I want to increase that effectiveness. And as we've touched on over the rest or the rest of this segment, it, it's so, so important. There's so many things that sleep does and sleep is the king of our life. It is the thing that runs and repairs everything, right? And if sleep is off, the things that are keeping us alive cannot continue to perform optimally, right? Which taking it out of consideration, training as a whole, health as a, as a goal of a lifelong longevity across a lifespan, you have to sleep and you have to sleep well consistently across a lifespan. It's not that you, man, I, well, I slept well when I was 10 all the way till I was 20. I'm good right? That, that's not the case, right? We need sleep across a lifespan consistently to be good. Um, and there's strategies that we spoke upon here that help us implement that. And so why I brought up the lion is basically quit thinking you're weak um, and quit telling people they're weak because they like to sleep or they prioritize sleep. You're the weak one for saying that. And I'm going to put you on blast right here, right now. Okay. So restructure the way you're thinking about that. Um, and it's not going to be an easy transition if you're someone who has that mindset, okay? Um, I'm not here to discourage. I'm here to empower you to give a shit about it and fix it uh, because it is so important. And as someone who has spent the last couple of years with real sleep issues, it completely changed my life for the negative um, when I was not sleeping well, okay? And over this past six months or so, eight months, I've really, really, really turned that around. And I, I can say I'm altogether a 
better version of myself um, than I was. And obviously there's a lot of components of life that get, gets in the way, but it, when it came down to it, it was me not wanting to take ownership of having to fix that component of my life or putting the effort in to fix it because it wasn't an easy transition. It wasn't an easy change and it wasn't an easy fix because I had to change a lot of habits that I had accumulated that were not helping my cause. Right. And so I'm here to put you on blast, but I'm also here to shit on myself for a moment because I was the one not doing it right. I was the, I'm the, I'm the one that's in your camp right now. All right. So I'm speaking from experience and I'm also speaking from a professional sense of you have to do it. Um, and then I will just finish up and say that alongside a lot of the nutritional hormonal, um, things that do happen from a physiological perspective, it's also going to play in those things. Those underlying physiological things are going to also play into, uh, your training volume, the amount of training volume that you can now handle. Uh, your recoverability and your ability to handle fatigue throughout a session or a phase um, or training week rather. So it's really important um, to utilize auto-regulation if you can, um, meaning if, you know, you just got a kind of a crappy night's sleep, this does happen. This happens all the time. It's a, unfortunately a byproduct of our, the world we live in today. Um, and depending on sort of the responsibility you take on prioritizing sleep, but sometimes you could do everything right. You just don't have a good night's sleep for whatever reason, right? And that's okay, but you have to also then adjust or start to adjust, right? If it's a really shitty one to two nights of sleep, maybe that bleeds into three, like we have to start manipulating training to an extent, right? And this is where auto-regulation comes in. Um, and so let's say you had five sets on deck for, pressing tomorrow and after three you're just like wow it feels like i just did five of the hardest sets of my life after three maybe we start to auto regulate things maybe we either reduce loads maybe we just reduce the overall sets um, and this is a conversation that you are going to have with your coach or whoever you're working with or, or just yourself um, but it's going to hinder and the, the longer this persists it's going to hinder it more and more right so after one night you may be able just to have some pre-workout um, cause caffeine has shown to kind of counteract sleep detriment, um, over like kind of a day's, uh, timeline. So if you have a rough night of sleep, maybe you can take some pre-work out before you lift in the morning or in the afternoon and be okay. But also don't, again, as we said, don't use that as a crutch because if you're, let's say you're training at night, you can't then take caffeine, which is then going to keep you up, which is going to be that perpetual feedback loop of hell of never sleeping, right? And you're going to throw off everything that we just worked so hard to fix. Okay. So it is important and I'll kind of wrap it up there, but sleep, sleep is not for the weak. As we've said, um, I, I think sleep is one of the most selfish and intelligent decisions you can make in your life and to surround yourself with people who also prioritize sleep and being a smart human. Um, and don't act with recklessness because unless you are a 13 year old, um, uh, you still should sleep as a child child. That's probably the most important time to sleep. So even if you are 13 sleep, um, but we're not kids anymore, at least the ones listening here. Right. So make the adult decision sleep it, uh, it your health depends on it. So that's why I'm just going to wrap that up. Um, and if you want to gain muscle and lose fat, you should also sleep. Yeah. And one thing I want to add in before we finish up this episode is just like Austin said, we aren't all perfect in these situations. Alex, Austin, and I all have our own shit that we need to deal with and that we need to address. And like with caffeine, as I said, I have 100% overutilized caffeine and I have 100% um, negated sleep when I needed to. And so of two other tips within sleep is if you are finding yourself doing that, waking up at 4am going to sleep at midnight, um, because I know Alex and I semi recently got into a bad habit of going to sleep at 1am and waking up at 5am not a good habit to get into. Um, but it was something that we just moved our sleep time up by 15 to 30 minutes each night instead of being like, we're going to sleep five hours earlier because that's a really hard transition on your day. So that's something as far as moving your sleep time up just a little bit each day is going to be helpful. But also as Alex talked about within scent association, also looking at room association. So making sure that you're not doing stuff in your room, in your bedroom, um, making sure that you are leaving that for sleep <laughs> 
and not making it something that you are getting revved up about something else. So before Alex and I met and he was so just put off by this. (laughs) I used to do everything in my bedroom. At that time, I didn't really have a good relationship with my roommate. So I just like hid out in my bedroom and I would do work in my bedroom. I would eat in my bed, which now I realize it was never a good idea. Disgusting. (laughs) And Alex was very disgusted by me. Um, But I would eat in my bed. I would do work in my bed. I would do everything in my bedroom. And I had awful sleep issues. And now I look back and I'm like, well, you wonder why, Sue. So being able to look at what you're doing in that room and how you're associating that room to make sure that you're taking away from that. We don't spend much time in our bedroom other than going to sleep and then our bathroom getting ready and stuff like that. But it is not some place that I hang out throughout the day. And it's very much so improved my sleep quality and quantity. So just two last tips that I thought of as we are signing off here. And in room association, we're very much so all three of us are the understanding that it is certainly a luxury. So uh, if you're in college and you've got a, you know, a one bedroom apartment or things of that nature, you know, do your best in that sense of like being able to use the room association to its fullest degree. Maybe corner association, because I had to do that for a while. <laughs> corner association. It is. Michael Scott, paper company, uh, signing off. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. The corner that I relax can't be the corner that I work. <laughs> that's exactly right. Oh, God. All right, guys. That's, uh, that's it for today.